take one look at the first few minutes of Peter Weir's 1975 film Picnic at Hanging Rock, and it may bring to mind some of the great romantic painters of the 1800s. J.M.W. Turner, Thomas Cole, Frederick Edwin Church, and Caspar David Friedrich for you art history buffs. In fact, the entire film drips with that distinctive romantic beauty in its landscapes. An angelic Turner-esque use of light in its shots. What makes this so interesting is that Picnic at Hanging Rock is actually deeply critical of the Romantic movement, and shows us by using many of the ideology's most recognizable features as its critique. This is clear just in the first few seconds of the film. Those long, haunting shots of the film's namesake monument resemble great paintings because they're framed like a landscape portrait. They give the rock the power and majesty that romantics believed nature inherently possessed. However, Weir doesn't allow the audience to revel in its beauty. He undercuts the awesomeness of the images by accompanying the scene with the unsettling sounds of an earthquake. This uncanny effect alerts the viewers to the true nature of the landscape, preventing any notion of the Arcadia the characters will claim it to be. There she is, ladies. Hanging rock. The plot itself is built on a foundation of Victorian melodrama. Weir includes this to highlight the flaws in many tropes of romantic works once again. Romanticism praises individualism and intense emotion over scientific rationalization, which peppers the film in nearly all of the characters. Now I know. What do you know? I know that Miranda is a Botticelli angel. The high emotions of the characters and their inability to react rationally often are the very thing stopping them from accomplishing their goal of finding out what happened to the missing women. I wake up every night in a cold sweat. Just wondering if they're still alive. You know, the way I look at it is this. The bloody cop, the bloody abo tracker, and the bloody dog can't find all. No one bloody can. People have been bushed before today. And as far as I'm concerned, well, that's the stone end of it. Well, that's not the end of it as far as I'm concerned. They may be out there, dying of thirst on, on that infernal rock. You and I are sitting here drinking cold bloody beer. That's where you and me is different. If you want my advice, the sooner you forget the whole thing, the better. Well, I can't forget it, and I never will. In some cases, this is even reflected in the camera work. In this scene, the wild camera movements demonstrates the high emotion of Emily and her disorientation in her world because of that overwhelming emotion. In this scene, the effect distorts the eerie calm of Hanging Rock, coloring it as unpredictable and dangerous. This is significant as well because of the relationship with nature that Romanticism preaches one should have. It glorifies nature. Weir instead argues the dangers of trying to frame an unforgiving and volatile environment within the confines of a neat human ideology. He does this by showing how the characters' distinct misunderstandings of the realities of nature prove to be their downfall. Nasty here! I never thought it would be so nasty or I wouldn't have come! Must be 
be all of 350 million years old. So this year's lava forced up from deep down below. So the trachytes extruded in a highly viscous state, building the steep-sided mammotons we see in Hanging Rock. And quite young, geologically speaking. Barely a million years. Waiting a million years. Just for us. Like the voice of enlightenment coming through, Weir provides a check for their romantic notions. Michael, too, does not respect the reality of the dangers of the rock. He assumes he can find the missing girls on his own and resist the nature of the landscape. In the end, he, too, ends up confused, battered, and crawling. Romanticism teaches that civilization is the illness of society, and only a return to nature can cure humanity. While the film does not shy away from highlighting the worst parts of society, it argues that a return to nature can indeed actually be the end of you, if you don't respect or understand it. It is a criticism of Romanticism's innocence and ignorance of the reality of the world, and the idea that a human philosophy can change the nature of nature. Perhaps the most important question after all of this is, why? Why be so critical of Romanticism? The answer is as simple as where the film is set. The Australian climate is entirely different from that of the Europe in which the movement took place. It is harsh, unforgiving, deadly, and uninterested in an artist's notion of enlightenment. This idea is deeply rooted in Australian national identity, art, and culture. Weir's critique simply brings to light that philosophical movements are not always universal, and what works in one cultural and environmental climate doesn't always work in another.